Welcome to a Fountain of Life Worship Center. We're so delighted that you have joined us this evening for our Wednesday night Bible study online. We are studying from Luke, the 18th chapter and the 18th verse, and we'll just get started right up here. I believe Anna's going to read first. Go ahead, Anna. Luke 18, verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Let me, let me just make a comment or two here. Um, I've read this passage so many times all my life, pretty much, and... Uh, it dawned on me. You know how you read something and then finally you read it after a certain number of times and then the, just seems like a greater, revel, a greater level of revelation comes concerning this. I read this a few years ago and it just dawned on me for the first time ever. Jesus was giving this man an opportunity to be a disciple and to follow him. Think about have you ever thought about the people that may be around you in your lives that are Christians that would make the statement if you asked them, what would you do to follow Jesus? Oh, and they would say, they might respond with something like, wow, to follow Jesus, to see Jesus, to watch him do miracles, to be a part of, of the 12 disciples, his, his, his disciples and follow him everywhere he went. I would do almost, I would do anything, anything that was right, you know, that was godly, just to be around Jesus and see all that. Wow, I'd do anything for that. This man could have been a disciple. He could have been even one of the 12 apostles. He could have been a very, very close follower of Jesus. Jesus was asking this man, go and sell everything you've got and come and follow me. He was offering him the opportunity to be a disciple, and he failed the test. Now think about it. We understand from Scripture Peter, James, and John left everything. They weren't, I'm sure they weren't as rich as this man was, but they left their fishing business, they left their boats, they left their nets, they left everything to follow Christ. And Jesus was offering this man an opportunity. This man might have been seemingly, just from reading the passage, you know, it seems like to me he was maybe a little bit um, self-righteous, maybe a little bit, because you know, uh, Jesus said, you know, all the, you know, what, what, what must I do, uh, you know, uh, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, he says, well, you know all the commandments. You, you, you know what you need to do. And, and, and he starts naming a few of the commandments. And then the man very quickly comes back and says, oh, Lord, I've done all these things. You know, ever since I was young, ever since I was a child, I've, I've done all these things. And, uh, and then Jesus perceiving what, you know, Jesus could, could he, the, the discernment, the spirit, he discerned this man's heart. And he said, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you've got and come and follow me. He was offering him an opportunity. I believe had that man sold everything he had, if he had made a total commitment to follow Christ, he could have been named as one of the close disciples that was following Jesus. You might have read his name in the Bible a number of other places, or, or, read, or actually read his name for the first time because we don't even know his name. All we know is that he was a rich, young ruler. That's all we know about him. But his name is not recorded because he failed the test. He failed the test. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. I have never seen it exactly like that. You know, this man could have been recorded in not only in the Gospel of Luke, but in many other Gospels by name and used by God in an incredible way. But he failed the test. He went away sorrowful. His riches, his wealth is what controlled his life. 
Jesus, there, there's also a second lesson in this to all of us. Jesus wants us all to understand. I believe there's, this is, the, this is the, the message, is that he wants to be Lord of our life in every area, even our wealth, even our money, even, even our possessions. He wants to be Lord of our life in every area of our lives. You know, when, when, when Jesus has got your heart wholeheartedly, 100%, when he's the Lord of our lives, he's got all our money. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. That doesn't mean he's going to ask you to give it all away to the church or to, to some, you know, uh, godly adv adventure or, or, or godly uh, organization, you know, that's helping feed the hungry or whatever. But Jesus wants our heart. He wants our whole heart. He wants, he, wants, he, he wants to be the Lord of our lives in every way. And that's the way to have the greatest blessings in life is to make him the Lord of our lives. And then in the end, praise God, eternal life. Hallelujah. So Anna, go ahead and read a little more. Verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he had become very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Let me just mention one thing here too, real quick. The eye of a needle, a lot of people don't know what that means. A lot of, a lot of people, if you research it, you will find. I can remember as a kid reading this scripture and, and you know, and I saw a needle, a needle and thread, you know, and I saw a needle and I would think, a camel go through the eye of a needle? That's impossible, mm -hmm. you know. Well... The, a needle in that day was a, a little tiny corridor, not very big, about maybe like one meter square, maybe 40 inches square, a little over a meter square, through the wall, maybe through a big thick wall. If you think of a wall, maybe 10 feet thick, and you got this little tunnel through this wall. It was a, a tunnel through the wall into the city through which if a, if a foreigner showed up at night, late at night after the gates were locked or at a time when the gates were locked, then the only way he could pass his goods into the city was through the needle. They called it a needle. He had to go through the needle, through that wall. It was a tunnel through the wall into the city through that needle. That was, and yes, there were some camels that could get through that needle. They would get out on their, they'd get out on their knees, you know, basically in the tunnel and the camels would have to bow their heads down really, really low and just barely squeeze through that needle. So, but, but it was very hard, and sometimes it took hours. I mean, it might take four hours, six hours. If a person showed up after dark and the gates were closed, they might not get all of their goods and their camel through the needle into the inner, in, inside of the city on the other side of the gate. It might be midnight before they got everything in because, because it was just a very difficult, a whole lot of work to do. And in some cases, it was impossible. Some camels were too large. They just couldn't, couldn't get through the needle, so they had to spend the night on the outside of the gate. So Jesus said it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So it's not quite as hard as I thought of when I was a kid, when I thought about a needle, trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle, that, like a needle in thread, okay? So go ahead and read, Anna. 26. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. I've, then it happened. I've preached. I've preached and taught on that so many times. I won't say anything about it other than just point out that Jesus is letting his disciples know what his mission is. He's telling them, we're going to Jerusalem. 
and the Son of Man is going to be mocked and scourged and he's going to be killed. But the third day he will rise. And they still didn't grasp it. They didn't really understand what was coming, even though he says it so clearly and so vividly, but they just didn't get it. They didn't grasp it. Go ahead, Anna. Let's see, 34. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So, you know, it's, it's amazing that Jesus, even though thousands of people were following him, and, you know, and, and a lot of people, we've talked about this before, a lot of people, they talk about, well, there was 5,000 people uh, on the Sermon of the Mount. Well, the Bible says there were 5,000 men, 5,000 men. And then when he fed, the, fed the, the multitudes with fishes and loaves, it says there were 5,000 men. So there could have been 15, 20,000 when you add the women, when you add the children. I mean, Jesus was being followed, and my point is he was being followed, and he was teaching thousands and thousands of people. And yet, he had time for one unknown, pretty much unknown, blind man who came to him and said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. That's what I want. I want to be able to see. And Jesus heals him. Uh, Brother Mark, go ahead and you can start reading there at verse nine, chapter 19, verse 1. Yes, Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, who could not for the press, because he was a little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day of salvation has come to this house, for insomuch as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's just, let's just comment on this for a minute, and I'm going to kind of throw it open to conversation here, guys, if you guys want to put anything in. Uh, what do you get out of this passage? What do you get out of it? Austin? Uh, what I get is that even if, well, not even even if, like if you are someone who, in terms of the way society looks at you, you're not accepted as mm -hmm. being, I guess, a righteous person. Like they don't, they're like, oh, well, really? You're gonna follow God? You, you know, you don't live right, or, or you're a sinner. You know, we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. and it's not because of us. It's because of God's grace. God called this man to come and serve Him, and that that's what I get out of it. That it doesn't matter where you are, or where you're coming from. That it's God who calls you. Yes. Yes, amen. Well, uh, it is so true. Uh, Zacchaeus, well, I'll comment on that in a minute. Anybody else want to say anything about it? I think it's significant that um, Jesus get him out in the crowd. And that when he was, he was there, he couldn't even see Jesus because of the multitude of people. And he climbed the tree, and Jesus saw that and said, mm -hmm. I'm staying at your house tonight. I'm sure that came as a surprise to Zacchaeus mm -hmm. because I'm, 
no doubt he really didn't have a relationship with him at all prior to that point. Right. So Jesus had him in mind even at that point. And I think that's something that's, that, that's lost here. There, there is, and this is what I was going to say, Austin, there is an incredible contrast. If you contrast this passage to the passage in the previous chapter about the rich young ruler, he, he comes to Christ and you can just, I sense it in that entire passage about that rich young ruler, a little bit prideful. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, comes to Christ very humbly. He doesn't hesitate to throw down. His, I mean, yes, uh, he was probably pretty well known in, 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 in the community, but yet at the same time, he was not, he was not highly looked upon because they, they despised, pretty much didn't, no, nobody really cared much for tax collectors. He was a tax, tax collector. And uh, so he was probably pretty much looked down upon, and he didn't hesitate to throw down any, any pride or, you know, any that would be left, you, you would say, and climb a tree. I mean, man, you know, I want to see this man Jesus. I'm going to climb a tree to get to see him, you know, because he was a short man, the Bible says, of short stature. So he was willing to just throw down any pride, lay down any pride, any, any haughtiness, and say, I'm going to see this man Jesus, whatever it takes. And he climbs a tree. And then after he sees Jesus, I would guess that he had probably heard or seen some of his teaching. Maybe he heard him teach before somewhere when Jesus was teaching thousands. We don't really know the whole story, but I would guess that he had heard some of Jesus' teaching because after he, Jesus says, come on down, you know, Jesus comes up to the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. We're going to your house to that tonight. I'm gonna, we're going to spend time with you, sir. And then Zacchaeus goes to his house and says to him immediately, look at the difference. The rich young ruler wouldn't give his wealth or sell his wealth or, or do anything with his wealth that Jesus wanted done. This man on his own, without being asked, says, half of my goods, half of everything I own. And, and, and probably this man was pretty wealthy. Most tax collectors made back then, they were more wealthy than the average person in society. He said, I give half of my goods to the poor. And then he says, if I've done anything, you know, if I've done any shady business dealings, I'm kind of putting in my own words here. He says, if I've <clears throat> held anything from someone by false accusations, I'm going to give it back to him four times, fourfold. I'm going to take the other half of my goods that are left, and I will give that away to anyone that's been done, that feels like they've been done wrong, or maybe that I made a mistake, or maybe I didn't exactly represent the books perfectly, correctly, like I should have. I'm going to give them back four times what I owe them. This man was repenting. This man was, was surrendering his life to Jesus. And Jesus was, looks at him and says, Behold, he says, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Zacchaeus, you're a child of Abraham. And you are saved today. Your salvation has come to your home. Praise God. Isn't that beautiful? So it is so important. I think the lesson here, when you contrast this with the rich young ruler in the chapter before, the, big lesson, the biggest lesson of all is, is that when we come to Christ, it is so important to come with a repented heart and come humbly before him. You can't be arrogant in the, in the presence of someone who knows your every thought. They know your heart. Jesus he knows every, everything that we feel and think through his heavenly Father. He knows, the Father knows everything. And Jesus said, I am a Father of one. So through his Father, he knows everything together. They know everything about you. There's nothing hidden about our lives. Amen? Amen. I think it's amazing that, like you said, tax collectors weren't really liked back then. Like, they hated them. Right. But even still, he could have just been upset about that and had a, held a grudge mm -hmm. but instead he still gave his money to the people who hated him that's right that's exactly right i give half of my goods to the poor and if i've taken anything by false accusation I i'm going to restore it fourfold so you're exactly right yeah that's true so good austin okay mark go ahead read a little more so this is uh luke 19 verse 11, 11. yes and they then as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. 
because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that layest not down, and repeat thou, thou dost not so. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I what I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that it, in, at my coming I may have required mine own with uh, usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which I would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So this is basically the same meaning. The parable is the same as the, the ten talents, the ten talents. Uh, and at the end he says, you, you, uh, you were faithful with five, five cities or five talents, or well, not five talents, but set, five mina, mina. Therefore, I'll make you ruler over five cities. You were faithful with ten minas. Therefore, I will make you ruler over ten cities. But the person who did nothing for him, the, 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 the message is the same. If you've ever read the parable of the talents, you know, you, the, the people who did, the person who did nothing for him, it was taken away from him, even that which, which he had. In fact, you know, yeah, the scary thing about it, that's exactly right. The scary thing about this passage, if you want to call it scary, the, 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 the shocking thing about it to me that just shakes my inner being, so to speak, is that Jesus says to this person, you wicked servant. He calls them a wicked servant. So I think that Jesus expects anyone who's known him and, and been, a, been in the kingdom of God for any period of time, you know, that's been in the kingdom of God for, you know, maybe if they just got saved today, he wouldn't expect anything or tomorrow or this week. But if they've been in the kingdom of God for years, Jesus expects fruit. It's referred to in the New Testament also as fruit. He, he expects us to bring forth fruit. Just like we would expect a pear tree to, to bring forth pears, we would expect a, a, a peach tree to bring forth peaches. We would, we would expect uh, you know, a stalk of, wheat, uh, of corn to bring forth corn or whatever, or wheat to bear, bring forth wheat. You know, Jesus expects us to bear fruit. He expects us to bear fruit in the kingdom of God. And like I said, the almost, I don't know if that's the best way to word it or not, but the almost scary thing is that he refers to the person who doesn't bear fruit, the person who doesn't, doesn't do anything at all in the kingdom of God or do anything for God at all with their lives. He refers to them as a wicked servant. A wicked servant. So... Uh, everybody can, that does work in the kingdom of God, and I know we've got people here in this church right now that have been very faithful, you can, you can rest in the fact that you have a reward for, for, the, for the fruit, you have a reward for your labor that you've done in the kingdom of God. Uh, so everybody here can say, I'm going to be blessed. Yeah, I am blessed, to be honest. I am blessed, but I'm going to be blessed even more. Amen? Okay. Uh, so uh, we're getting down here. Go ahead, uh, yeah, uh, Austin, go ahead and read at verse 28 there, if you would, please, sir. 
When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Beth, Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent their way and found it just, as he had said to them, but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to him, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Let me say this just for a minute here. This passage um, takes place four to five, four days before he's arrested, five days before he's, before he's crucified. It's amazing. This is the triumphal entry of Christ on Palm Sunday is what this is. It's the way we refer to it. It's amazing that the people are praising him and worshiping him. And, you know, and here comes our king. Here comes, you know, here comes our, uh, the Lord. In the name of the Lord, here comes our king. Peace on earth or peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're praising God. They're worshiping. And then four days later, he's arrested by our time frame. And then five days later, he dies on the cross. The fifth day, he, he, uh, by Friday, he, he dies on the cross. And there is some debate about that, whether he died on Thursday or Friday. But the fact is, we know that just a few days, and some, probably some of the same people that were praising him we're standing in the crowds of thousands of people crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Because he didn't do what they expected him to do. They were looking for him to come, overthrow the Romans. You know, this is the man that worked miracles. This is the man that heals the blind. You know, this is the man that's got a following of, of thousands and thousands of people. And, and he's going to deliver us from Rome. And when he didn't do what they wanted him to do, they, some of them turned against him. And then, of course, the scribes and Pharisees, they hated him because, because they were, I believe they were jealous. They were jealous. They had, he had, the people loved him. A lot of the people loved Jesus, and Jesus had this huge following, and they hated him for that. So this is the triumphal entry of Christ. Um, might also point out that this was prophesied in the Old Testament, that Jesus would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, and he fulfilled this scripture specifically. You might say, well, he planned it. I don't think he planned, he was able, you know, how could, how could you plan, go to a certain place, in a certain village, you're going to find a donkey, and if anybody says anything to you about it, just tell them, say, the Lord has need of this donkey, you know. And, and sure enough, just as Jesus spoke those words specifically, they went to get that donkey and bring that donkey to Christ, and someone there says, what are you taking the donkey for? And they said to him, the Lord has need of this donkey. I mean, there's, you know, ex word for word, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And he fulfilled the prophecy concerning the Christ, the Messiah, by riding into a, a, a Jerusalem on, on a donkey on that day, on that Palm Sunday, as we refer to it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Austin, and read a little bit more. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So I've also talked about this, especially since we're just a few weeks now after Easter, 
about a month ago, I think was Easter, maybe six, five weeks or six weeks ago, uh, talked a, uh, preached on this and talked about it recently, but I will relate it to someone that might be watching today that, that uh, didn't know or didn't hear what, what I preached about, is that Jesus wept over, over Jerusalem, and he said, for the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you and will close you in on every side. Jesus knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew that in just a few days he was going to be rejected and then crucified. And he was going to die. And he knew that the third day he would rise from the dead. So Jesus pronounces over a prophecy over the, the people of Jerusalem. He tells them what's going to happen. The days are going to come. They're going to build an, Your enemies are going to build an embankment. They're going to surround you. They're going to build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And they will, side, and they will level you and your children within you to the ground and will not leave in you one stone upon another. This was fulfilled approximately 40 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. 40 more years passed. And the words of Christ were so specifically fulfilled, it just, it, it, it's incredible. It's awesome. A Roman general named Titus came. He hated the Jews. He hated, he hated what, you know, they had done they, because they had... Over a period of the last 40 years between the time of Christ and the time of Titus, they had had uprising after uprising after uprising against the Romans, against the Roman uh, soldiers. So when Titus came, this general from Rome came with tens of thousands of soldiers, he basically decided this is it. We're going to demolish the, the city of Jerusalem. We're going we're to basically wipe it off the face of the earth. This city isn't going to exist anymore. Not only did they go in and kill all the people, you know, may, maybe make slaves out of some of the younger ones, but they, they went in and they, just, they ripped all the gold and the silver out of the, out of the temple, out of the, you know, the wealth. They took all the wealth from the city, and then they tore the buildings down stone by stone, piece by piece. He basically demolished the city. And the words of Christ were so specifically fulfilled until it's just, it's just incredible. They sit part of the city on fire. I do know this too. Archaeologists have discovered they sit part of the city on fire. And when it caught fire, some of the buildings, I think maybe even the temple was part of the building. When it, when it, when it caught fire, the gold and the, 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 and the uh, silver that was, that was involved in building the building melted and went down. Some of the silver and gold was there, that was there that was in, that room, in the rooms w went down into between the cracks of the stones. So that even gave them more of a reason to tear those stones apart. They tore those stones, stones apart piece by piece and scraped up the gold and the silver that they could find that had gone down in between the cracks of the stones. They utterly demolished Jerusalem, the city. So go ahead and, and read a little bit more here. We'll finish up. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him, and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So he goes in immediately and, and corrects, what he feels is a, you know, well, really what it was, a grave uh, error that the, the house of God was being used as a place of selling stuff. I mean, this was carnal. This was, this was you know, was not godly at all. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And he drove out the money changers. If you read other accounts of this, it says he, flipped, he threw over their tables, the, the, the tables that they were conducting their business on. You know, they were selling, for the, someone that might, know, might not know what was going on there, they were selling lambs and animals and, and doves. You know, if you were real poor, you were able to buy a bird and offer it as a sacrifice to the priests. Well, why should I go to the trouble of going out in the country? If I, let's say I lived 20 miles outside of Jerusalem. Why should I go to the trouble of going outside here in the country where I live and catching animals and then hauling those animals all the way to Jerusalem I can just make some money somehow maybe plant a crop make money for my crop then I can go to the temple in Jerusalem 
and I can buy what I need. I can buy a lamb. I can buy an animal to offer up. Or I can, if, you're consider, if you were really poor, they would allow you to offer up a bird, a, a dove or whatever. I can buy a dove and I can offer it up. You know, it's just convenience, man. It's just so neat. It's so nice. You know, that's the thinking of that generation. And so right outside the temple door, they were selling people, the, the animals, the birds, whatever the, whatever the sacrifice was that they wanted to offer up. They were selling that to the people that were coming, and they were making money off of it. And Jesus saw it. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. He flipped the tables over. He drives them out. He says, this is not what's supposed to be going on here. So that's what happens. And then he was in the temple daily teaching every day. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders, and the people sought to destroy him. They wanted to kill him. They were planning to kill him, but they, they couldn't because they, at this point they said they were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Was, the people loved him, and they were listening to him. So we'll pick back up next week um, uh, at chapter 20, verse 1. And thank you for joining us. We hope you got something out of this. Uh, I always, of course, enjoy talking. And uh, I think everybody here got something out of it tonight, didn't you? You guys enjoy it? Okay. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Uh, we'll just bow our heads in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word tonight that we've heard. I thank you for every person online that has joined us in this Bible study tonight. I ask that they be blessed, that their lives be blessed, that they be protected that give them good health and make them prosper, Father, in all that they put their hand to do, God. Bless every family that's listening to us, every young person and every elderly person, every working person, every person in every posi position in life or profession, Father, may they be blessed. And join us again next Wednesday night as we resume this Bible study, we give you glory and honor and praise because you're worthy and you deserve all of our praise tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight at a Fountain of Life Worship Center for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, let me mention that this Sunday we will be having... For the first time in two months, we will be having our live online service for the open to the public. So you can come to our church at 9.30 a.m. as That's our first service. And then our second service is at 11.15 a.m. And we would love for you and your family, you know, to come and join us and be here with us. Uh, you can go to our website. There are some guidelines that we're going to be going by that the state of Texas uh, has asked, the governor has asked us all to uh, 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 try to put in place those guidelines. So if you want to go to our website and read them, you can at afountain.org. It's A-F-O-U-N-T-A-I-N, afountain.org. And you have a blessed week, and hopefully we'll get to see you at a Fountain of Life Worship Center this coming Sunday morning. God bless you.